uh, here at Providence College. And it's a great pleasure for me today to welcome all of you, uh, faculty, staff, students, uh, and alumni of Providence College, um, and friends of the college, and members of the local community, uh, to this afternoon's uh, presentation, which is part of the lecture and colloquium series, Theological Exchange Between Catholics and Jews. It was exactly 45 years ago today that the groundbreaking document, Nostra Aetate, also known as the Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, was proclaimed by the Second Vatican Council. After centuries of distrust, hatred, and violence, this landmark document of the Second Vatican Council set a new tone for relations between Christians and Jews, and called upon Catholics and Jews in particular to enter into a fraternal dialogue to foster mutual understanding, respect, and cooperation. This series can be counted as a fruit of that call in, if, in its effort to promote interreligious understanding and dialogue by focusing on themes of mutual religious and theological interest in the Catholic and Jewish, tra Jewish traditions. In short, we see this as a unique opportunity for Catholics and Jews to learn about and from one another. Today's lecture, which is co-sponsored by the Department of Theology and the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies, would not be possible without the generous gifts of our donors. Uh, in particular, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Diocese of Providence, uh, the Edward and Barbara Feldstein Family Fund of the Jewish Federation of Rhode Island, uh, Judy and Arthur Robbins, uh, and our other donors, uh, both alumni and friends of the college. Uh, we thank you very much for your support of this series, which makes events like this even possible. Uh, our guest today is Rabbi Peter Stein, spiritual leader of Temple Sinai in Cranston, Rhode Island, and president of the Rhode Island Board of Rabbis. Uh, Rabbi Stein was born and raised in New York. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell uh, and an MA in Hebrew Literature from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. He studied for the rabbinate in both New York and Jerusalem and was ordained in 1999. Before coming to Temple Sinai, Rabbi Stein served at Rodef Shalom Congregation in Pittsburgh, and in 2008, he was named a Brickner Fellow of the Religious Action Center and the Center for Leadership and Learning. He has been an advocate for the poor in Rhode Island and has worked closely with the leaders of other religious traditions in the state. In many ways, it is because of Rabbi Stein that we are here today, not only because he is our featured speaker, but it was just about three years ago this month that Rabbi Stein reached out to the diocese and the theology department with an invitation to collaborate in creating opportunities for Catholic Jewish engagement. That same year, Peter and I traveled to the Vatican together to participate in a conference on Catholic Jewish dialogue. Uh, and this lecture and colloquium series was conceived as a result of that conference. Uh, also since then, uh, Rabbi Stein and I have collaborated on a number of adult uh, education programs uh, many of the participants uh, of which are present here this evening, it's great to see you all, uh, at both Temple Sinai in Cranston and my own parish, uh, Holy Apostles in Cranston. Uh, and these have been um, excellent opportunities for Christians and Jews to speak about our own traditions, to discover and appreciate the religious heritage we share, uh, and to learn about each other. Uh, and they've been, uh, they've been occasions for honest discussion and debate, for spiritual and intellectual edification, and for creating and deepening friendships. This afternoon, Rabbi Stein offers us a reflection on vigorous and respectful debate, an essential part of fruitful dialogue, drawing upon biblical and rabbinic sources in his talk entitled, For the Sake of Heaven, Biblical and Rabbinic Lessons on How to Debate. Do you join me in a warm welcome of Rabbi Peter Stein. Thank you, Arthur, so much for that wonderful introduction. I always feel when I hear an introduction like that that I should record it and send it to my mother so she can hear these things. <laughs> but it really is uh, an honor, and I'm really humbled to be here this afternoon to share some, some thoughts, some reflections, and some history with all of you. Principally, what I hope to do is to talk out of my own tradition, out of Jewish history, when it comes to these questions about how we have a dialogue or a debate that leads us to a good and productive place. But even as I talk out of the Jewish tradition specifically, I believe that the examples I'll provide are examples that all of us can follow 
when we find ourselves working together in diverse groups, be it Jewish Catholic dialogue, Jewish Catholic Muslim trialogue, or other such examples. And the example that I would like to use to begin is actually a biblical example from the five books of Moses. And it's the story that's told in the book of Numbers of a man named Korah, Korah who rebelled against Moses. And it's a somewhat difficult example in retrospect when we look back at this example because one of the things that we know about Jewish tradition and certainly one of the things we know about Christian tradition as well is that dialogue and debate, asking hard questions and challenging authority can all be considered a good thing. But the example in the Torah that's given in these five books of Moses is a very, very negative example. In the book of Numbers, we read that a man named Korah rose up in rebellion against Moses, the leader of the people. In short order, Korah and the other rebels are all taken out. They are swallowed up alive. They lose their lives, the entire band of rebels, because they rose up against Moses. So at first read, we can read this, we can consider this text from scriptures as a warning that we better not rise up against our leaders. We should not challenge authority. And we should not have any kind of vigorous or adversarial debate. But when we consider this biblical example in its rabbinic context, how is this discussed by the early rabbis? We see that the problem is not with having a disagreement. The problem is with how we conduct the disagreement, how Korah held himself against Moses. In a theological sense, the objection to Korah is that when he rose up against Moses, he was not rising up simply against a human leader, against a president or a prime minister or a chairperson. He was rising up against Moses, the prophet, who was selected by God to be that prophet, who was selected by God to be the leader of the people. And so when Korah rose up against Moses, he was really rising up against God. His confrontation was not simply one person objecting to another person's leadership. His objection was to God's choice of leader, to God's path. This is part of a broader teaching in the biblical text called Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers. And in the Ethics of the Fathers, we read an instruction about having a debate or a dispute. The Hebrew word that's used is a machloket. And a machloket is a dispute or a debate. And what the early rabbis urge us to do when we have this kind of a debate or discussion is to aspire to make the machloket, the debate, one that is for the sake of heaven. And the rabbis hold up two contrasting examples. A machloket l'shem shamayim, a, a debate or dispute that is for the sake of heaven. And the machloket shelo l'shem shamayim, the de debate or dispute that is not for the sake of heaven. The example that they give for the wrong kind of debate the debate that is not for the sake of heaven is the one that I gave. They cite the example of Korah. They say this is the wrong kind of debate because it's not for the sake of heaven. It was not for holy purposes. It was because of Korah's own selfishness, his own greediness, his own desire to advance himself rather than a debate or a dispute that ultimately would serve to elevate the divine. So the rabbis in this teaching want to provide the opposite example. Who stands in opposition to Korah, giving us an example of this machloket, this machloket that is for the sake of heaven. And the example they give is quite an interesting one. They cite the example 
of two first century CE rabbis, two of the early teachers and sages of the people, one of whom was named Hillel, and the other of whom was named Shammai. Now, Hillel, the word may be somewhat familiar, especially to the students in the room, because Hillel is the name of the Jewish club or association on many college campuses. And it is named in honor of the great teacher, the great rabbi Hillel of the first century. But what we know about Hillel as we read about his life and about his teachings is that Hillel at every turn had an opponent. And that was Rabbi Shammai. So here are the rabbis considering how do we debate, how do we dispute, and they say, don't be like Korach, don't be selfish or self-centered in your, in, your, in your work, rather you should be like Hillel and Shammai. And we stop and we say, well, wait a second, Hillel and Shammai disagreed with each other on hundreds and hundreds of points. If one of them said black, the other said white. If one of them said night, the other said day. They disagreed on everything, every chance they had to enter into a discussion. How could we possibly hold up Hillel and Shammai as the example of the right kind of debate or dispute? Their debate and dispute was so contentious, so difficult that it even entered into what we might consider picayune points of religious practice. So consider the winter festival of Hanukkah. The central ritual of Hanukkah is the lighting of a candelabra. A candelabra that has eight branches to it to symbolize the eight nights of the holiday. And the tradition is to light the lights each night of the festival. And Hillel and Shammai were so opposed to each other, so adversarial, that they even disagreed as to how to accomplish this seemingly simple ritual. Rabbi Hillel said, on the first night of the festival, you light the one candle. On the second night, two. On the third night, three, etc. Till on the eighth night, the final night of the festival, you light all eight candles. It seems a very reasonable approach to count the days of the holiday by performing this ritual. But then comes along Shammai, his opponent, and Shammai says, even that isn't the right thing to do. What Shammai says is you start with a full candelabra, all eight candles lit on the first night, and then you count down. On the second night, you do seven, and then six, and then five. So Hillel and Shammai were so opposed to each other that they couldn't even agree on something as simple as this ritual for Hanukkah. It's picayune. It seems to argue for the sake of argument rather than over something substantive. And yet, they're held up as the right example of how to debate because in the consideration of the sages, every time they approached a question, even when they fell on opposite sides of the question, they were doing two things, and those are the two things that we consider when we ask questions about how to debate. Number one, it is this notion of doing the debate for the sake of heaven. They weren't doing it for selfish reasons. They weren't doing it to advance themselves so that their name would be on the front page of the newspaper or the lead story on the nightly news. They were doing it for the sake of heaven. Their only motivation was to better our religious tradition, to improve our religious practice, to honor God. So number one is to approach debate for the right reasons. And the second point, when the relationship between Hillel and Shammai is considered, is that they always, without fail, showed respect for their opponent. They didn't tear the other one down. They didn't use derogatory language about their opponent. They didn't demean or diminish the credentials of their opponents as sadly we see too often in debate today, Hillel and Shammai, arch rivals, opponents, on every question of law and belief and practice, always in their words and in their actions, tried to elevate the other person as a worthy opponent and as an admirable and respected leader of the people. So I begin with this example, this machloket example of a debate 
for the sake of heaven. Because it introduces, I think, the two valuable themes. One is the motivations for conducting a debate. And the second is how we're treating our opponents in debate or our partners in dialogue, if we broaden it into that sort of a forum. The other example to begin also comes from this early rabbinic teaching from the second and third century CE. And it's a teaching that contains a similar sort of idea to the Machloket one. That when we conduct debate, it needs to be for the right reasons. When we come together for dialogue, it's for the right reasons. Elevating God, elevating the divine presence, elevating the worthiness of our religious traditions and practices. And it's a teaching in that same Talmud era. And I'll give you the Hebrew phrase first. The Hebrew phrase is elu ve'elu, divrei Elohim chayim. And in English, this teaching says, these and those are the words of the living God. This is a teaching that comes out of the second and third century and reflects an approach to asking hard questions of those who you disagree with, but having the perspective, taking the stance that says what you say and what I say, both of them reflect the words of the living God. In other words, both these and those are something that should be treated as sacred something that should be treated as important. It doesn't mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean that anything that anybody spouts is worth doing. Rather, it's a reflection of the motivation of those ancient sages, and I think the motivation that brings so many of us into situations of dialogue today, when we come together as groups of Catholics and Christians and Jews and Muslims when we come together for the sake of understanding, it's on this premise, that these and those are the words of the living God, that your tradition and my tradition, both of them are serving something sacred in our world. And it's this teaching that provides, I think, a theological premise for debate or dialogue, that we come together motivated by wanting to honor the sacred in the world, even though we have such sometimes radically different understandings of what is sacred and how we pursue it. In order to understand that teaching, let me say just a little bit about the places where I'm drawing the teachings from. First, when I use the word Bible, of course, just to clarify, I'm referring to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament books, the books that were written centuries before the Common Era began. After the Bible, the Old Testament was complete, the Israelite people led lives peacefully in the land of Israel, adhering as closely as possible to the laws that were stated in the Bible. Those laws principally centered around a religious life in Jerusalem, in the temple that was built by King Solomon. And the Jews lived in the land, led by the Levitical priests, offering the sacrifices, all of it as described in the Old Testament books. That brings us through the BCE centuries until the turn into common era began, and life in the land of Israel was thrown into turmoil. The Roman invasion of the land took place and along with that political invasion, there was a grave threat to the religious life of the people. What it meant was the Israelite people could no longer follow the laws of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Especially after 70, when the temple was destroyed, it simply wasn't possible to follow the laws as described in the Bible. There was no temple which meant there were no sacrifices that could be offered, which meant that the Levitical priests did not have the ability to fulfill their leadership role. So in that first century, the Jewish people faced an existential crisis and answered that existential crisis by creating 
a new kind of leader, and those new leaders created an entirely new kind of discourse. Those no, new leaders, of course, are called rabbis. The word rabbi means teacher, and those first rabbis came into the, into the, into the Jewish world in the first century CE. And their purpose was to look carefully at the Bible and to ask a very difficult, very challenging question. How can we survive with these holy scriptures as our foundation, as the root of our covenant, if we can no longer do the overwhelming number of things that are mentioned in the Bible? And their work, their scholarly efforts and their leadership efforts are captured in the dialogue and discussion written now in the books called the Talmud. So the two teachings that I cited so far, the first about the machloket, about the dispute that is for the sake of heaven, and the second one about these and those are the words of the living God, both of them emerge out of this context. The early rabbi saying, we want to be a biblical people. We want to continue to be faithful to the covenant with God and to follow the laws that God has established in the five books of Moses, in the books of the prophets, and in the books of the writings. But we have to reinvent ourselves. We can't simply say we're going to do that because the temple was destroyed. The majority of the people were no longer in the land of Israel at all. And so their perspective in all of the chapters of the Talmud was elu ve'elu. These and those are the words of the living God. When you open up the Talmud to, to study those teachings, you see the work of human beings, personalities, real flesh and blood men, Hillel and Shammai and all the others, some of whom were conservative and some of whom were liberal, some of whom were forward thinking, some of whom were, were somewhat regressive, some of whom were eager to assimilate and accommodate change, others of whom wanted to sort of circle the wagons and, and preserve the old ways. So we see a lot of personality, a lot of human personality emerging out of these books of the Talmud written in the second, third, and fourth century. But what we understand theologically in the Talmud is that every word of every one of those rabbis was simply an attempt to interpret the words of the Bible for a new generation. The words of the Talmud, in other words, are considered a kind of scriptures. They are sacred. They are brilliant human beings trying to draw out what God wants from us in a new generation. In the previous generation, they had a much more direct path to understanding what God wanted from us. They had the Bible. Now we still had the Bible, but we had to reinterpret it. So the idea of these and those are the words of the living God mean that we're trying to understand God's will in our own time. And that's the principal motivation behind all of the theological debate we see in Jewish tradition and in our own time in the interfaith dialogue that so many of us are involved in. Continuing forward in the timeline, the greatest medieval sage, a rabbi whose name was Solomon, the son of Isaac, known by the Hebrew honorific Rashi. Rabbi Solomon, the son of Isaac, who lived from 1040 to 1105, principally in France, but also in border communities in Germany. He was the greatest of the medieval sages. He advanced in his own time that idea of taking God's words in the scriptures and translating them, interpreting them for our own time. And Rabbi Solomon was a brilliant teacher, and as is often the case with brilliant teachers, he attracted a number of disciples and followers. Some of them were his own sons-in-law and grandsons who followed him into the academy. And one of Rashi's grandsons became the great leader of the next generation in, a, in the scholarly academy. But 
what we see when we read the discussions between the two of them, that this was not a case of a disciple simply bowing down before his teacher, simply doing whatever his teacher said, agreeing with every word of his teacher. Rather, the grandson, whose name was Rabbeinu Tam, had some pretty significant disagreements with his grandfather, the great founder of this academy. And I'd like to give two examples. What underlies both examples is what I've already said, that they approach the debate to honor God, and they approach the debate to show respect for the other. They never diminished or demeaned the other person, even though they, they disagreed. So one question between Rashi and his grandson is how to handle the phylacteries. Now, phylacteries may not be a familiar tradition to all of you. In the five books of Moses, one of the commandments tells us that we should bind these words, meaning the laws of the Bible, we should bind them as a sign between our eyes. And it gives root to a tradition where we have black leather boxes with parchment scrolls inside the boxes, parchment scrolls that have passages from the scriptures written on them. And there are two sets, one that is worn on the forehead as a sign between the eyes, the other that is worn on the arm connecting into the heart and soul. This is a ritual practice that is done by observant Jews each weekday, six days a week as part of their morning rituals. And the question is, which passages should be inside the phylacteries? That's a relatively straightforward question because there are four places in the Bible where this kind of a symbolism is mentioned, bind them as a sign between your hand. So the four passages sort of obviously present themselves, but beyond that, it gets to another one of these somewhat picayune questions about how exactly we should do this tradition because if this is what God wants, we want to do it in the right way. So Rashi and his grandson had opposite approaches, which mean that now if you go into a Jewish ritual shop to buy uh, a set of these phylacteries, there are two completely opposite sets of phylacteries, one that has them written on one long parchment, the other that has four small parchments written, uh, one with each verse. So it's one example. The other example, I think, is uh, even more familiar to those who live in Jewish homes. There's a verse, again, in the five books of Moses that tells us we should place the words of the law on the doorposts of our house. We should put them on the doorposts of our house. It originates in the story of the Israelite slaves in Egypt where they placed the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over their homes in that whole saga where the plagues were afflicting Egypt, ultimately leading to God taking the Israelites out of Egypt and into freedom to Mount Sinai to receive the revelation. And so the tradition was born that we have this mezuzah, is the Hebrew word, this small case which is placed on the doorway of the home with these words written within it. And again, these two rabbis come down on opposite sides of the question because they were always rivals. And so the question was, what's the best symbolism here? So we have, on the one hand, the idea that the mezuzah should be placed straight up and down on the doorway. Because after all, God is in heaven and we are here on earth. We should place the case on the doorway straight up and down as a way of remembering God when we place these holy scriptures at the doorway to our home. The other perspective was a little bit different. It said we should place the mezuzah horizontally, side to side, to show that we're taking these teachings with us in and out of the home, that when we go into our home, there are sacred obligations that are incumbent upon us. There are behaviors as part of our religious covenant that we should adhere to in the home. And similarly, when we go out into the world, that's in a sense where our ministry begins. That's where we go out to do God's will to make the world a better place. And so we take the one rabbi saying, place it up and down, the other rabbi saying, place it side to side, and I, I'm sure if we paused and took a poll, we would have lots of different answers. Some saying, well, this seems reasonable, some saying this seems reasonable, and some saying they have no idea how to fulfill this tradition. 
Without asking anyone to venture a guess, I see a hand in the back. That's right. The answer is, if the one rabbi says to do it like this, and the other rabbi says to do it like this, the way we do it is like this. <laughs> and we smile at the example, but it's evidence that these two rivals still had the utmost respect for each other because they recognized that each one had a legitimate point of view. Each one had something reasonable to say. And so that is the custom that is followed throughout the Jewish world today, even a thousand years later, that we angle it on the right-hand doorpost with the top pointed into the home, saying that we bring the sacred teachings of the scriptures into our homes, the bottom pointing out to say that when we go into the world and we approach other people, that we bring the scriptures with us as a moral voice, as guidance there. So we have this other example of the rivalry. But I want to, to, to add to that a little bit to explain that all of Jewish scholarship, theological scholarship in particular, is not about rivalries. It's not about disagreements like we have with the Hanukkah custom, like we have with the mezuzah. And there's a, a, a wonderful teaching that describes Bible study. And if we think for a moment as faithful people of whatever religious tradition, whether we're Jews, whether we're Catholics, whether we're Christians, what is it that we consider when we open up the sacred scriptures? What is it that motivates us to take those words which are thousands of years old into our lives? To a certain extent, we use that study in a sense as consulting a rule book. We want to know what our obligations are, and we want to know specifically how to fulfill those obligations. And so we open up the scriptures and the generations of comments on those scriptures as a way of finding out what to do and how to do it. But I think there's a spiritual component to studying scriptures that goes beyond that sort of mechanical exercise. I know for myself that oftentimes when I read the words of the Bible, I do so hoping to find inspiration, hoping to find comfort, hoping to find a message that speaks to me about my life and my purpose in this world. It's not all about ritual details. Sometimes it's about the fact that we hold in our hands the very best, very closest evidence of God speaking to us in the world today. And so the teaching about how we study scriptures envisions the student entering into an orchard. And in that orchard, as they go deeper and deeper, and we can picture a beautiful, lush, forest or orchard full with lots of fruit and vegetation, as the student goes further and further into the orchard, they gain more, they can pick even more fruit, and they can, they can learn even more. Think about walking along the outskirts of an apple orchard. You might see a nice looking apple on the tree there at the outskirts, but if you walk further in, you might find something that is even more beautiful, that is even sweeter, that is even better. And so this is the approach that's taken to studying scriptures. It is a uh, play on words in a sense, in that it is both an acronym and the Hebrew word for orchard. So the word that is used is pardate. And again, the word pardate means orchard. And a pardes is also linguistically derived from the word for paradise. So that as we go further and further into the orchard, as we go deeper and deeper into our study of the scriptures, we are getting closer and closer to a perfect world where God's word and God's will is known to us in a real way. So the acronym part comes from the idea that there are meanings to the verses of the scriptures beneath the surface. So when we first endeavor to study, we hope to determine, to understand 
what is called in Hebrew the Peshat. The Peshat is the simple meaning of the words, the plain meaning of the text. Very simply, what is this passage of the scriptures telling us? Plain and simple meaning of the text. But if we are so blessed, if we have patience and, and are blessed with wisdom and insight, we can discover as we read the text carefully that there is a remed, a hint of something more in the text. When we start to see allegories in the text, that's saying that there's a message beneath the surface. There's more to this passage of scriptures than simply the, fa the face value, the, the plain meaning. And that remez, that allegorical meaning of the text, can lead us to what in Hebrew is called the drash. The drash is the metaphorical meaning of the text. So as we study, if you picture it spatially going into the orchard, or as we unpack the text, we find there's a, a surface meaning to the text. Then there are allegories that tell us, keep studying, keep thinking. There's something more here. And then we discover the metaphorical meaning of the text as well. The fourth is somewhat perplexing. The word, the S stands for the Hebrew word sod. Sod means secret. That in the text, there are not only these allegories and, the, and these metaphors telling us something important, but that if we really understand the text, that we will, in some spiritual or mystical way, be closer to God. That there is that kind of a secret meaning to the text for those who are truly blessed with insight and will bring us closer to God since the scriptures are understood as God's message to us. And the challenge then is this. We have this, this approach that says there's these different layers, different meanings, all these metaphors and things that we can discover. How do we go about doing that? How do we find them? And the rabbis of old and continuing into our own time were very specific in the best way to discover these deeper meanings in the text. It means that I don't take my scriptures, go off in the corner by myself, and study, study, study until my eyes hurt and I have a flash of insight, and I discover the meaning of the text. Rather, the very best way to do it, the prescription from 1,800 years ago, is that we study together with partners. That when we enter into a dialogue, then we can truly be blessed with insight, because it's not just seeing ourselves in the text, it's seeing the other person in the text, and it's also the dialogue or discussion between the two people can create a more profound insight. So the urging is that we apply ourselves to dialogue when we're trying to understand spiritual matters, re religious matters of any sort. And that, I believe, is the real potential in coming together in our own time, in our own lives, for interreligious dialogue. That I, as a Jew, don't enter into interreligious dialogue simply to cheerlead about Judaism. And I don't enter into interreligious dialogue simply as a curious outsider to say, Father, can you teach me about your tradition? Rather, we enter into this dialogue so that together we can learn not only about the other's tradition, but we can learn more about our own tradition. When I enter into an interreligious dialogue, I learn more about Judaism in addition to learning about the other religious tradition. But that together, the interreligious dialogue can help us understand more about the world in which we live and the ultimate goal and vision that we share of making a world that is filled with peace and harmony, a world where those who are vulnerable are provided for, a world where those who are in need are cared for. The triad that is presented in the Bible time and time and time again, if you sit with a concordance and look at the repetition of words in the Bible, 
the triad that is repeated again and again more than almost any other phrase in the entire Old Testament is the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And these three are held out as the ultimate example of what our obligation is, to care for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, to provide for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, because in the ancient world, in the biblical world of 25 and 3,500 years ago, the social structures were such that those who lacked a spouse, those who lacked parents, and those who were in a foreign land were particularly vulnerable. They lacked a security blanket to help them in times of trial. And so this repetition again and again and again that what we are here to do is to look out for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger is to say, make the world a place where those who are vulnerable are taken care of. And the interreligious dialogue that we have is not just to understand our tradition or your tradition, but together to say, how can we understand the world? How can we understand our obligation in this world a little bit better? I'd like to um, advance forward a little bit with a couple of examples from our own time. Just a few months ago, there was a terribly rancorous debate beginning in New York, but becoming a nationwide and worldwide debate about the construction of a Muslim center in Lower Manhattan. What, what, what was called a mosque and what was called Ground Zero. But of course, when we look for the nuance in the question, it was not a mosque, it was a community center, and it was not at Ground Zero, it was near Ground Zero. And this debate really devolved. It really descended into a place where I think most of us recognized whatever we think about how to debate and all those important questions, we knew that this debate was not being conducted in the right way. And uh, Archbishop Dolan in New York had some wonderful comments that were very constructive and I think insightful into the difficulties in that debate and into uh, debate or controversy in general. Dolan was quoted in the New York Times as saying that we should approach this question acknowledging that both sides of the debate have legitimate stances. That what he perceived as one of the difficulties was that they were tearing the other side down. Instead of asking nuanced questions about what to do, they simply said this shouldn't happen at all. Instead of saying maybe there's some something to the perspective expressing concern, saying absolutely this has to be done 100% positively. So one of Dolan's comments had to do with recognizing that both sides of the debate have legitimate stances, and his other comment really talked about the, the role of religion in our own time in public life today. And he said that religion ideally can enter into debate to encourage reconciliation and community. That if we think historically about the role of religion, sadly there have been too many moments of violence, too many moments of destruction that were done either wholly or in part in the name of religion. Oftentimes we would say these were perversions of the religions, but nonetheless they were done in the name of religion. And in the, in the discussions in New York around the Muslim Center, part of what Dolan said was, religion should enter the debate to encourage reconciliation and community. And I think that's an important perspective, as with the ancient examples, that we respect our opponent, we approach the debate for fruitful purposes, not to tear the other person down or not to advance ourselves, and that ultimately, religion should encourage us towards building community, towards increasing uh, a sense of togetherness and reconciliation. The other example, also from our own time, but from a far less exalted source than, than uh, the Archbishop, is from John Stewart, who seems to be everywhere to these days, and uh, has taken on a lot more gravitas than 
I think he ever envisioned or any of us uh, imagined that he would have uh, at least this quickly. And a few weeks ago, uh, Stewart was uh, speaking at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. The, uh, the, the debate was moderated by one of the reporters from National Public Radio and uh, touched on a lot of different things. But he had one phrase that really stood out for me, especially as I considered this opportunity tonight. And Stewart, of course, thinking politically, thinking about the political parties and the divisions that we see today, what he said was, we need to be opponents, but not enemies. And that's the way we need to approach the other. We should be opponents, or we can be opponents, but not enemies. And I think it, it, it is a reminder, again, of the, spirit of, de of the spirit of debate, but also of the approach that we should take to debate, that we have opponents. Having opponents is not a bad thing. Oftentimes, having an opponent or a rival or, or a study partner who pushes us can lead us to great places. If we look at them as opponents, not enemies. If we look at them as working like us for the sake of heaven. If, if, if like us, we look at our opponents as trying to elevate the community to create a sense of understanding. The idea of opponents as opposed to enemies. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the biblical tradition, we read, of course, of the three generations of patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham and Sarah, Rebecca and Isaac, and then Jacob and Leah and Rachel. And Abraham is the father of all three of our great religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We can approach debate as in a sense, a family conversation, just as we sometimes push our family members uh, pretty hard. We can approach one another saying that we're family. We're all the children of Abraham. But there's something else that comes if we advance it to two generations to Jacob. Jacob, of course, was the father of the 12 tribes, the father of the generation that went down into Egyptian slavery and ultimately after the four centuries there, went to Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. Jacob, if we read carefully his narrative in the book of Genesis, was given a second name. Jacob was given the name Israel. And throughout the remainder of his life, after being given that name, he was alternately called Jacob and Israel. But the name Israel is the one that is celebrated by calling us the children of Israel, the children of Jacob. And Israel, pronounced in Hebrew Yisrael, literally means those who wrestle with God. And being mindful of that, we don't discourage debate. We don't shy away from adversarial situations, but rather we hope and we aspire, and we work towards the, the, the setting, the dynamic, the feeling that all of us are Yisrael, all of us are wrestling with the divine, trying to understand God's place in the world and God's purpose for us in the world today. And I thank you for the opportunity to share these ideas and would love to answer some questions from you.